all for one family on stage. Their first gig, The Cars. Yeah! It didn't go in that we could actually be meeting our producer or that this could be a major record year for us. If you feel the emotion in every song, you give across the emotion of the song. You have been a wonderful audience and we will remember this. We will be back. When you're put in a situation where you have to perform, where you have to deliver, no matter what, if something happens. That's why we're doing it. We're doing it because we love it. Hi, my name is Basha Zamorska, and I was the stylist on the Forgiven, Not Forgotten photo shoot, and you are listening to Causecast. Hi, and welcome again to Causecast. With episode six, we're taking a short break from our focus on the music production side of the album to start to look at the album's promotion. Specifically, the now iconic images, which have stayed with us for decades after first seeing the album and the singles. In this episode, we speak with Basha Zamorska, who was the stylist for the album and singles. Because this episode predominantly talks about visual things, such as clothing and images taken, you'll find extensive reference in the show notes with timestamps when Basha or myself refer to an image or a piece of clothing, so that you can have further clarification on the images and items of clothing that are being discussed. Our conversation started with me asking Basha about her background prior to working with the cause, and what experiences she had before being chosen to work on the photo shoot itself. How did you get to the point where you are with the cause on this shoot, and how did you get to the point of being a stylist for this shoot for them? The journey to that point, that background, before we go into the shoot stuff, would be really lovely to hear. Yeah, absolutely. I was destined for a life of academia, wanted to do French and German combined honours, and I wanted to teach um, French and German modern literature. Rock and roll and fashion read their ugly heads. <laughs> um, I took a year off between uh, sixth form college and going to university and I went to Belgium where Anna, where I was an au pair mm -hmm. and um, not really liking children very much which was not the best planning but I was abroad and speaking one of the languages that I was destined to and uh, all I seemed to do was go out and see bands mm. and then I came back did a couple of years at uni and I don't recommend people do this, especially now, but obviously I went to uni for free, but mm. I spent all my grant on going to see bands and bootleg records from Portobello Market. Oh, and then I went to Berlin for six months to improve my spoken German, where I continued to see bands. <laughs> <laughs> I came back and uh, didn't finish my final year because I failed one of four um, of the exams. So I had to study up. And in that next year of supposedly studying up, I got a job down the King's Road managing a women's fashion store, which was also a men's fashion store. And lo and behold, people like uh, DAF, Deutsche Amerikanische Freundschaft, mm -hmm. would walk in, um, the Thompson Twins, wow. um, uh, Spandau Ballet, uh, I mean, uh, Steve Strange became a friend of mine. I, I went clubbing every night and and then I, I got fired for being late, moved to another store, which was much more my pace where everything was black leather, even though mm. I'm a vegan now. I missed a good deal of post-punk mm -hmm. because strictly speaking, punk was over by 77 if you're gonna be a snob, and, and I am. I never went back to uni and somebody asked me to assist them and they happened to be the in-house stylist for you 2 and The Stranglers who were both on the same label. And I found myself yeah. pushing st metal studs in with my fingers because we didn't have any proper um, tools yeah. uh, into uh, Bono's cut off denim. And I remember him calling one day, telling me he was lying on his bed in, the, in his bedroom 
looking down the Mississippi and there was one of those old steamers. And, and he said, where are you, Bashan? I said, oh, I'm just pushing flipping studs into your next wow. bloody denim jacket on wow. the floor of the woman I was working for, who I left. I started up an agency, one of the very first hair, makeup, styling, and hairdresser agencies called Creative Workforce run by a woman who was a PR and she is still in business. Her name is Carol Hayes and she's a wonderful woman. And she got me my first job. She called me one day. I found myself, I sort of handed her the project and thought, well, where do I fit in? I thought I was going to be answering phones, um, which was what I was doing for this other woman. And it just, I, I wanted to be out there doing creative stuff, not stuck in an office doing VAT returns. So Carol said, do you want to do a Frankie Goes to Hollywood video? And I found myself saying, yes, I had no idea what I was doing, none. So I did the Two Tribes video. I had no assistant. I didn't know I could ask for one. And I was with the boys for about a year and a half. I did all their photo shoots. And uh, yeah, two, two Tribes was my first ever proper styling job. So I kind of jumped into the fire. Sometimes that's the best way, right? I just said yes and then figured it out. And I found that that actually served me well through my styling career because if before the internet, if you said yes and you had reference books, you could figure it out. Yeah. I worked for about five years in London, um, came to uh, the US ostensibly for one freelance job for German Bazaar, ended up being persuaded to come and be here. I got an agent. She said, I'll get you your papers if you come back. And my first client that sort of got my foot on the, the A-list ladder was Christy Brinkley, who then introduced me to Billy Joel, whom I adore. He's one of the funniest men in the world. And he, he introduced me to a certain Mr. Tommy Matola, who then introduced me to his to-be wife, Mariah Carey. And in between, there was other people. Sure. So that's the truncated version. And Connie and Russell would have, we did the whole Louis Vuitton campaign together. I, I think we had probably done a band or an advertising shot together. And so when they asked me to do the course, I don't remember the chronology of the Louis Vuitton campaign, but we were pretty much a good team by then mm. and they totally trusted me. So um, they didn't have to worry about what I would bring to the shoot. Wow. They just said, do your, do your thing. They might have um, had an opinion on say they might have said, um, okay, can we put Caroline in pants and sort of a dress so that we get a silhouette from her? So that, that would be the amount of their input. It wouldn't be, I don't really like that dress. There would be a, a much more technical reason for it. Yeah, a visually technical reason rather than a aesthetic or personal taste input. Totally, yeah. And I did other musicians with them um i think annie lennox was one of the most memorable ones um that was an extraordinarily strong shot and then it it sort of faded into memory and i always kept i always was aware of them and then when they started posting their pictures they were just such loves that they actually credited me and it was mm. just really um I, I thought it was um, just really gracious of them to do that because there's a lot of my work out there that yeah. um, people don't know I did. And I'm one of my friends um, laughs at me. He's um, a makeup artist that's done every superstar imaginable and he calls me the credit queen. I did have a little bit of history in, in the UK um, before I came over here. Um, but you know what? I can't even remember anyone really um, prominent that I worked with, except for uh, Prince Charles's alleged favorite group, uh, the Three Degrees. Wow. The, yeah. Um, 
which was an absolute freaking nightmare because one of them was pregnant and they didn't tell me and that was great <laughs> that's the life of a stylist yeah because it's yeah it's in very in the moment i guess it's very in the moment and when people lie about their measurements is also another favorite of mine which the course didn't do they were angels. And I don't remember if I actually got on the phone with them because what I used to do is say to the uh, manager or the press officer, please, can I have a conversation with them? Or please, can you give me a printout of what they like and don't like? Like if, if one of them likes to cover her arms, let me know that. If one of them only likes to wear trousers, let me know that. If one of them only wears flats, I need to know this stuff. You can't, you, you can't not give me that info. Yeah. Too yeah. much is at stake here. Exactly. So. Did you know it was going to be a album cover shoot? Uh, yes. Back in those days, what tended to happen was the record company would milk us for everything they, we were worth and say it was going to be an album and all of a sudden I'm like oh look there's a press shot oh look there's a single sleeve that came from the album cover shoot it yeah so I knew it was important and I think uh it wouldn't surprise me if um we had been told oh it's for album plus mm. like anything else I, I I don't actually remember because it was such a personal thing, uh, I think there was just a really nice vibe about it. But we, I, I definitely do know that I had no idea that they would be so huge. Now, what when we shot it, do you know the timeline of how successful they were in the UK by then? They, they weren't. I didn't think so. They'd done three TV appearances in Ireland only. Wow. Um, one in 92, and then they did some TV confirming in Christmas 94 that they were about to fly to LA um, and basically start recording. So okay. I don't know when this happened. I don't know okay. when you shot this. So when I was going through the pictures, I suddenly realized, oh my God, Connie's right. Because she, when you said that she thought that they had shot it in LA, I looked at some of the stuff and I was like, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. There's a couple of shots that somebody else did, but it was very much in keeping with the vibe that we set in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who did that because I don't recall flying over to do the LA shoot I mean I cannot remember being on a beach with them I would remember that I have video in 94 of them wearing those clothes so I think they're their own oh okay that's nice because they sort of kept it going that just makes me really happy that's kind of a a baby triumph of of uh, of a stylist like if you if you set someone on a journey and they're like yeah i'm comfortable with this i'm gonna keep wow. it going that's really nice and especially when they take it as their aesthetic for an album or a project which is so you know this is their entire baby this yeah. is their entire focus and life's work at the moment that representing Absolutely. this visually on an album um for that to then carry on yeah, so I'm assuming that those clothes are actually their own. Yeah, I mean, often the um, the person that would get not flown over, often, if they could avoid it, would be the stylist and they would use local talent, as oh. they called it, yeah. so they didn't have to pay for hotels and all that kind of stuff. But um, if the band were like, no, we got this, then good for them. Yeah. Um, and I have never, ever seen a bad picture of them. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. With, especially with four people, you think, oh, you know, something's going to be wrong or this isn't going to quite know, work. Watching her life go by When her days are grey and her nights are black Different shades of mundane and the one-eyed furry toy that lies upon the bed 
has often heard her cry and heard her whisper and her name long forgiven but not forgotten you're forgiven not forgotten you're forgiven i don't do it anymore i am un i was going to say unwillingly but that's not really true I have been forced to retire because I have a rare neurological condition, which means I can't style anymore. And the choice was taken away from me. And it's sort of a blessing really, because I'm happy to be at home. And when the time is right, I'll go into private consultation for individual women. But the stress and the madness, and I was actually, when I was making my coffee just now, I was trying to visualize, I'd be lying if I could say I could specifically remember the night before I got my bags, my body bags, we used to call them, and trunks ready. But I would have raided my own closet, plus I would have rented, plus I would have um, bought and returned um, yeah. because I don't know how much you know about what I, what I would have done for a living especially with how wide the fan base is there'll be people that don't even realize that your job exists oh yeah so yeah a lot of people a lot of uh a lot of the mariah carey fans that i've been in touch with that uh, they're so sweet they they actually think that um i get to keep the clothes or that the artist does and it's just not true except for extenuating circumstances and um, so a lot of what would happen, um, say Connie and Russell, the Guzmans, mm -hmm. would have said to me, we're shooting at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is very urban and crappy and desolate. And I, you know, which is very me and them. Mm. Um, because we always had a very when the three of us got together there was always a left of center thing that came out and obviously i don't mean politically no. but it would be twisted in some way and we would reference um either an artist or another band mm -hmm. um uh say for example they might have uh, referenced um you know a picture of Dylan when he was uh, sitting in a crappy door in New York and that would I you know, they wouldn't have to say any more to me I'd be like it's okay I know what I'm doing and then I would get sent pictures by the record company actual photographs that would have to be put on a bike messenger and sent to me um, because there was no other way of looking them up and if I was lucky, I would get a CD or I think we were beyond cassette tapes back then. It was the turn of CD. It really was. Yeah. And I can't remember, but I would never, I would absolutely not have seen any footage. So I saw these four incredibly ludicrously beautiful impossibly sculpted and dropped down from heaven angels and thought this is going to be a piece of cake mm -hmm. and then um of course being the realist i am um realized that's that really depends on their personality and how cooperative they're going to be and how they get on with me whether they trust me, which is such a big deal. And I do remember that at some point we had all decided that black was going to be okay, that it was the thing. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was just like breathing. And so I am absolutely certain that I would have raided my entire closet just looking at the girls knowing that they would fit into most of my stuff. And then I went shopping and I went to 
a company that specializes in catering for stylists who rent things out. And then a couple of sh um, fashion showrooms um, with whom I had a good relationship um, would say, sure, you can come in and borrow some, some of our stuff from say last season, which I sort of take pride in that my looks are timeless. Mm -hmm. If I can pat myself on the back, if someone can say, you know, when was this shot? And, um, you know, sometimes hair or makeup might give it away. Sometimes the shape of a trouser might give it away. But um, on the whole, it's you, you can't tell. And I consider that a triumph. And the main thing is that the people have to feel comfortable in it. And it just worked. The girls um, had, you know, I was working with slightly different body shapes. I don't remember specifically if anyone had any hangups um, about any part of their body, which I'd be too polite to go into anyway. But it would be unusual if someone said, oh, I feel absolutely 100% confident about the way my body looks. Especially in front of somebody they haven't met for very long. Yeah. In clothing that's been handed to them to wear. I mean, that level of trust is a skill set you obviously have. And also I would like, I always like to make the artist feel that they are part of the choosing process. Um, and I, I actually would make that happen given, um, and it wouldn't be fooling someone into thinking, oh, I've tricked them into thinking they made this choice. It would be saying, look, I feel quite strongly about, you know, having had you try um, this dress on and this shirt and pair of trousers and jacket on, here's 10 things that I've put aside for you. You tell me if there's any of those you don't like. Nice. And we'll weed them out and then we'll work with the rest. And then the big thing, which um, makes you good at your job as a stylist is making sure that you don't blow the best outfit in, a, in not the best situation location mm. so say the guzman's thought that the a shot that they're they're sort of um you know the absolute hero shot they call it yeah. um would be shot with absolutely nothing going on and then being super still i would say let's try and if you're okay with it let's try and make your favorite outfits be the ones that are in that shot yeah. Yeah. and also i don't want you to think about what you're wearing my aim is to make the artist not even think about it think about working with the camera um you you know you're beautiful already you're going to have hair and makeup that you'll be happy with yeah. uh presumably and so that you i don't want you to worry about how something is fitting, how your bum's looking, what the, you know, you've got no cleavage showing. I'm on your side. I was for them. And if they had any misgivings, they were to come to me and tell me and that I would be absolutely okay with it. With some people, there's a, there's a, there's a strange wall of, um, just for the sake of argument, let's call it a wall of uh, sort of, secrecy or uh, almost going into mistrust where you're working with the photographer and I've actually had photographers say to me can you make them do x y or z and I just think no no mate you do it I'm not not your you, job. you are putting me in a really unfair position and I'm not doing it and on the shoots with them that did not exist because we were we were so excited about what we were doing when we looked at the Polaroids. Um, 
oddly enough, I don't have any Guzman Polar. Do I have one of Mariah? Anyway, um, I think that they worked off them or with them or anyway, I'm sure that in order to continue to get the amount of looks that we did, mm. that everyone was happy. And also looking at the outtakes, they looked like they were having so much fun. There's, there's a real element of just freedom and joy. And we've come to Brooklyn and we're shooting an album shoot. You know? Utterly. This is... Utterly. And there was nobody looking on. No. We were left alone. And I think it's probably luxury flats or there's a, a supermarket built there right now. I haven't been down there for a while. Can I correct you a little? Oh, well, go on. I found it last night. After many years, I found it last night. It is in Greenpoint. And what you were on top of, it was a metal stamping corporation building. So they were doing metal stamping. Oh. Below so they're making buckle brass buckles and, and then plastic forming. Um, loads of all the buildings around it have been modernized, changed. It's exactly the same. And I was able to contact the owner of the building who has taken photos from the rooftop, which I can share. Oh my God, that's so exciting. You got me closer than I ever had been before. Um, and I, I looked at the photos again. I was looking around the yard and I was like, this is, this is not working. What on earth's going on? Ah. And I looked some more. Must have been another band. Quite easily. Quite yeah, um, it's it's you know iconic area to shoot because it's so iconic in in its in its backgrounds. Um, something that wasn't used on this shoot, I must add. Uh, the, you know the Empire State Building and stuff. You can just turn left and it will be there. It wasn't used, so that makes sense. That makes complete sense. You could actually go to that part of Williamsburg and start shooting, and because it was desolate and unused no one actually stopped you so it was our oh you know don't bother with the permit no one's going to yeah. move us on by the time the founders will have got the shots so don't worry about it <laughs> but i'm sure the goodsmans did not work like that especially when they're on the top of a factory building yeah um you know i was trying to remember what we did for how to um where we were changing and i was so used to working in crappy uh locations where everything as soon as you put something on it got dirty unless you lay down some plastic bags or some newspaper because mm -hmm. you couldn't change because it was you know it was dirt and i can't remember i was looking at, at outtakes again i was like oh i wonder if i kind of set up shop in a van, did we have an RV? I'm sure we must have rented an RV. I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. I wonder if Connie and Russell could remember that. I'm, I'm pretty sure that we wouldn't have been thrown in. Actually, there wouldn't have been enough room in a 15 passenger van. Um, mm. So we probably parked up um, a nice brown plastic um, RV and worked out of that. Wow. Um, so that uh, we didn't get all dirty. And also I had so many clothes for oh. the four of them. And I think for Jim, I probably, I, I think I went to Paul Smith, who's one of my, of course, I've got to fly the flag for a Nottingham designer. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm sure I, I rented from Paul Smith for him. Um, and raided my ex-boyfriend's closet, but I bought them the clothes Anyway, so it was part of the deal. I buy you this, but I can borrow it back for a shoot anytime. <laughs> Working relationship, if ever I had one. Yeah. And um, in terms of um, how they were on set, I, I just remember everyone being joyous. With the Guzmans, with photographers that were less experienced, I would help the artist work with the camera but with the Guzmans you just you could walk away and let them get on with it because there was remember there were two of them on set one of them would be on the left hand side on their knees looking up into the band and then the other one would be looking straight on 
so you'd get both and there was artists that we worked with who preferred one side of the face only and I had to tell them you can't do that um which was really funny <laughs> and you know who I'm talking about um so yeah so we sort of got double I suddenly realized oh my god we were the band was sort of doing all kinds of stuff yeah. that I don't remember and it would was probably because there were two cameras going most of the time mm. and then their editing process they were really fair to each other it seemed pretty even-handed yeah nice but they had their own little vibe and I'm sure that when they were editing they knew oh yeah that's a Connie shot that's a uh, that's a Russell shot, but I can't tell you looking at the pics who's who's is who's. A lot of my questions are obviously fans have been looking at the this album um, and these images of this album for twenty five years. Mm-hmm. And a lot of there's a lot of questions that have gone unanswered about what's going on in the photos. Generally, let's just go through the images and then anything that that comes to mind. Andrea's dress is a, a moire zip dress and it's um, probably by Moschino. I, I think I rented that. Um, Jim looks like he's in um, a black t-shirt with um, like a, a well-fitting Paul Smith jacket over it. Then we've got a shiny, it looks like a Catherine Hamner, which would have been from my old closet. I have an, an archive which I slowly got rid of when I stopped doing bands. Um, Sharon's jacket was part of a suit coat that was probably from the Paul Smith women's collection. I don't know what she's sitting on, but we would have used the Guzman uh, aesthetic would have been as shitty as possible. And she looks like she's sitting in a pool of oil. It's fabulous. (laughs) Cool. I'll move on. I'll move on. I love this one. It's so, I love the coyness. I love Andrea's coyness. Sitting on what is probably uh, an industrial ball used for God knows what. Okay, this is, I love the fact that we've got really skinny silhouettes. I think we didn't change every time. We just moved locations because it looks like they're all wearing the same here. Yeah. Yeah, and I like the length. Like right now, I'm kind of having a hernia because I would have liked to have narrowed um, the pants. That's what was going on then. There was slightly wider pants. 90s stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and Jim looks like he could have walked off a catwalk right now. Mm. Yeah. He totally does. So I love this one. It's adorable. Beautiful, isn't it? Have you any idea, any recollections regarding that ball? Like, was it to one side and they played it? You just have no idea about it at all? No, I don't. But you know what? I bet you any money, if it meant getting the shot, me and Connie and and Russell would have rolled it into position. Absolutely no question we would have all done that. If it was there already, then yay for us. Mm. Yeah. I don't even know what, what it's made of. It looks like... It is uh-huh. wood. It is wood. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, but that's one of the mysteries of this album. The, you know, we've got the rear of the album cover and then the inside, the, the last page is the back page of the booklet has this wooden ball on it. Hilarious. That is so, that's so, it's so Connie and Russell to do that. And I love them for it. Yeah, it's a fun. Little, it's mystery. The little freaks. Ambiguous. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. So this is a, an alternate shot from the album cover, final shot. Um, uh-huh. And is this one you did? Did you style this? Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I recognize, I'm just looking, I recognize uh, Andrea's shoes, those, these little lace-ups I had. I think her and I were the same size. And yeah, those are my shoes. <laughs> and I, which was completely normal for me to bring that. Jim's looking dapper, and we've got that um, uh, we've got that shiny suit again. Yeah, I can't and, in the shiny stretch suit, right? Yeah, 
Sharon is in a dress that looks like something that's from my archive. Um, it, and it looks like it's a scallop laced edged um, Tahari dress. I, I, I'm a big fan of lace overlay over anything and my wardrobe is full of it. So I would have brought it to the shoot. Wow. Um, so it, it does look like that. I can't quite tell and it's long under the violin. Yeah. 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 Uh, so we're back to the rooftop, but stood against the fans. Oh, look at that. The little, uh, the little vest. Oh, and the little slit skirt. That's so cute. Um, the, okay, that same long jacket. I love jackets that look like they're sort of um, frock coats. Yeah. Like Brian Jones rock and roll jackets. So we use that. I see we use that a lot. I know that we would have swapped outfits on girls uh -huh. because they made it their own. Yeah. Like, and they wouldn't have minded. They wouldn't have said, oh, but I've already worn that. It's It wasn't like that at all. Um, and I think, I mean, I'm not bonkers about the, the vest and the skirt, but I, I, I recognize the little slits in that skirt. Can't remember who it's by. And then just a, a nice plain black shirt and, and pants in front of the, the wind machines with ribbons Mm. in them just to add some movement to it not for any reason just for the hell of it and would they have been hired those machines yes we would have hired we would have hired them in yeah and the the striped trousers on sharon in this shot um they're very distinctive like wow do you know what it could have been an h&m because i would have got i would have gone i would have gone to the like urban outfitters and h and m just to get basics as well just for fit and for different um uh for fit for hu the humans and for just width and length and all that stuff yeah wait jim's fabric is the same as sharon's so that would have been the same designer oh wow yeah, I would have got a men's version and a women's version, but I love the length of his frock coat. And that to me is timeless mm -hmm. for anyone who has ever come anywhere near an instrument in that. And you've got a shot. I'm sorry, but yeah, I just love yeah. it. Yeah. I'm so glad Jim kept that jacket on for as long as he did, because he just looked ripping in it. And I love how rough and windswept they all look. I like how messy the hair is. I'm so glad we didn't do pristine hair. Yeah, because the lines in the clothing are clean and it just, yeah, it works. It just works. Yeah, that's great. And there's a lot of love in there and a lot of togetherness. Yeah. I love it when, when women sit like that for a shoot because it looks very, look at me as if you're telling me to go fuck myself. And it really brings something out of, someone it, it just works especially for uh insecure guys it it does the trick but it also works on women but they've got it by then anyway so you know if there was any music played during the shoot is that how they would have worked or would it have been silent but it looks like they're actually playing stuff it does look like they're actually playing stuff and i bet you any money they did I don't remember for sure, but I know we would have been thrilled. So I find it hard to sleep, don't you know? Sun is shining in my window, life's in flow. typically would play the band's own music 
while we were shooting on a little at the time a ghetto blaster yeah but i don't remember for sure if we did that then so for to have them playing here it looks like they're actually walking along playing there's movement in like, there. yeah yeah like a, they're a walking band mm -hmm. that's really interesting um i don't remember the grass i just remember that location being really shitty and would you also have done accessories because i know andrea in this shot and some other shots she's wearing a plain necklace i don't remember accessories i remember it not being a mm -hmm. focus um i normally had a small bag full of stuff with me but i can't swear yeah. to it and i was a big fan of telling the band to keep on wearing what their thing is if there's something that they never take off please don't take it off cool. yeah just to keep like stay yourself i forgot to tell you um this um is that um bands often buy stuff off me and if it's from a store i can say ah yeah absolutely i'll just put it on your bill yeah and if it's especially if it's an inexpensive Okay, this is, I mean, I don't think Club Monaco existed back then, but say if it was um, an inexpensive store and it was um, affordable uh, and it's like, oh God, I'll wear this forever. I'd be like, just take it and I'll shove it on the bill and don't worry about it. If the record company was like anything the band wants, they have to pay for personally, which happens a lot. And they may have just bought stuff off me and and kept it i don't know i can't i can't swear to it but it's possible thank you so much for your time it was a pleasure that's really really kind and i think it's great that you're doing this and i'll um and i will regale you with some funny um photo shoot and rock and roll stories because 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 you'll enjoy them can't wait okay my dear okay bye hun bye bye Another huge thanks goes out to Basha for agreeing to be part of this series and a special mention needs to go out to her beloved cat, which featured briefly on this episode. The geo coordinates of the rooftop for the album photo shoot mentioned in this episode can also be found in the show notes. As always, if you've enjoyed this episode, please do go back and listen to the others if you haven't already done so. Again, I'd ask for those that have listened to leave a review or subscribe on the platform that they've been listening on, just so that others can listen and hear the content themselves. Basha briefly mentioned that she has a rare autoimmune condition called stiff person syndrome. This condition affects one in a million, and Basha is certainly that. She does have a GoFundMe set up for donations to help with her general living costs until she is able to set up private styling in the future. If you wish to contribute to this, then please use the link in the show notes to donate directly. I should just take a few minutes to thank the many that have reached out during the last few episodes release, thanking me for the amount of time and effort I've put into producing the episodes and how wonderfully they're enjoying the content. So thank you for those that have reviewed, liked, subscribed, shared on Instagram, Twitter, etc. on Facebook. It really helps encourage me to carry on with the series. And it's wonderful to know that now thousands of people have listened to the show and the five episodes that have been produced so far. As always, if you have questions or comments regarding this episode or previous episodes in the season, please feel free to reach out. The best ways to do this are either via Instagram, Twitter or Facebook, just with the handle at CauseCast. Next episode, we have another exciting guest regarding the promotion of the album before going back to focus on the music again specifically. Until that time, again, as ever, thank you for listening. And you've been listening to CauseCast. <laughs>